Good. So thank you for everybody joining us for the Illinois Fast Center workshop today. Um, we are featuring Roland Garten, one of our long-term consultants that helps many companies across the state of Illinois. And we are talking about post awards. So let's say you're successful enough to be awarded a phase one or a phase two award. Now what? Well, I'll tell you around here, we often tell people you should go talk to Roland right away. And the reason is Getting the award is not the is not the final end game. It's getting the funding. And if you want to go from phase one to phase two, there is an agency you need to please along that journey. And also there's a lot of bookkeeping, record keeping, employee timesheets, lots of things like that that you're going to have to manage. And Roland's always had really useful tools, plugins and QuickBooks and things like that that he can help our clients out with. And so I won't steal his thunder of what he's going to tell you, but I just want to give some gratitude to him of keeping so many clients um, clean through audits from the agencies and going from one successful submission to another, which means keeping happy customers in federal agencies. Um, just a shout out to the Illinois Fast Center. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one time outside of this session today, you can sign up for time with any of our consultants, including Roland Garten. And Sherry Saladay spends a lot of one-on-one -on -one time also just helping triage you to the right place. So reach out to Sherry if you've got questions that are just preliminary as well. And I hope you en enjoyed today. It is recorded and we will share it with you after this session and make it available on our YouTube channel. And one final point of housekeeping, I'll say, we're excited, my little um, uh, firecracker, to say that the Illinois Fast Center was just funded again oh. by a Small Business Administration. So that started for another year this, this month. And if you didn't hear it already, SBIR reauthorization went through Congress for another three years. So we are all happy to be talking about money that we can still pursue. And I hear from a little birdie that we may have some announcement about what's happening in Illinois with matching funding soon. So stay tuned on that. And Sherry will tell you more about reauthorization tips and updates coming soon. Thanks. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen here then. <coughs> and I apologize in advance. I have a bit of a chest cold. It's not COVID. I went ahead and got the test done. It's not COVID. But I will take time out to cough, which should give you plenty of time to collect your thoughts and ask your questions. Uh, let's see, share screen. I want to share <clears throat> screen two share. Okay. You should all be able to see the title uh, page here. Um, <clears throat> there is so much to cover in how to manage a business after an award that there's no way I could squeeze it into an hour or even a day. Um, so what I've done here is just kind of touched on some of the key areas that you need to think about. The goal being to prompt your questions. And so I'm hoping this is an interactive session and that you consider questions and feel free to raise your hand or pop questions into the chat because I will only cover a few generic kinds of things to think about. I won't cover your specific questions. <clears throat> so as you have them, put them in the chat. I don't see the chat. Sherry's going to monitor the chat and she'll uh, forward any chat questions to me or raise your hand and Sherry will call on you and unmute <coughs> in case it's easier <coughs> just to talk to me um, rather than to put the information in the chat. All right. Also, share your experiences. We learn a lot from each other. And we learn a lot from war stories and horror stories that we've had in what we've encountered, those of us who have started business. Another word of background is that I spend about half of my practice helping people get proposals. And I spend about half of my practice as a consultant, as a business manager, helping people run the businesses once they get the proposal. So I have a lot of active experience, cradle to grave, from proposal through helping to run the business, <clears throat> through closeout, through commercialization <clears throat> with lots of companies over time. And so mostly in these seminars, I've been sharing my proposal writing tips. This time is kind of new for me. I'm talking a little bit about some of the back end and operation stuff that we're going to be <coughs> covering and that hopefully if you're successful, you will get 
an opportunity to deal with. All right, you know, what are the general areas? When I think of the general areas of uh, what you need to have, I mean, it takes a lot of people, a lot of systems to put together an entire team to support a business. Obviously, at front of the stage, customers and customer support. You need to have people eventually out there who are buying the product, and you need internally to structure to support them so that they can uh, <clears throat> be happy in their pursuit of the project. You need collaborators, a lot of partners, a lot of players, a lot of people that you work with. These include distribution partners. You know, the network has to be vast. You need that. You need to have internally technical and operations people. You've got to have people doing the work, running the show, and they have to be organized. <clears throat> they have to be effective. <coughs> <laughs> and they need good leadership, an executive and administrative branch. A lot of people who come out of the university are a little weak in the executive and administrative experience section. They're great academicians, but they don't have a lot of business experience, and there's a lot to learn in terms of running the business. So you need to somehow acquire and accumulate that level of expertise. You need to have finance and payroll. <clears throat> You need to have a system to keep track of books that's accurate, that will suffice for audits, that will suffice for tax purposes. You need to pay your people. You need to pay W-2 employees as full employees. You need to pay contractors as 1099 employees. You have to have a system set up for doing payroll. <coughs> you need to have legal assistance. Usually you won't have a person on the staff who's a legal authority, but you will usually have a counsel that's on retainer or available to you. You have to have that lined up. And that's only part of the picture. There are lots of others that I'm not even covering here. <clears throat> so you need to have all of these areas, and these are the general areas, seven of them, that you need to make sure and, and have a team together and have a system in place. I won't be covering all of these areas today. I'm going to focus on just a couple of areas. I will talk mostly about finance and payroll and a little bit about technical and operations because running the proposal and keeping your program manager happy is heavily related to technical and operations. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> why is this important? Well, it almost goes without saying, but just to go over some of the uh, main areas, <clears throat> unless you spend time and put all of these systems in place, you may not get awards or you may be delayed in getting awards. This has happened quite often. Now in the proposal writing process, when you are selected for an award, either phase one or phase two, you get a letter that says you've been selected for an award. Now you have to answer a bunch of administrative questions. You have to prove to us that you're a financially viable company and that you're capable of handling the administrative and paperwork that's required for managing this award. And if you can't respond to those questions accurately and adequately, your delay could be awarded or your award could be delayed, or you could not get it at all. I have seen companies been selected for an award and then turned down after financial review, especially at phase two level. Phase two, the award documentation is pretty severe. It's pretty harsh. With NSF, there are two whole rounds. One is a budget round and one is a financial round. They're, they're, they're quite detailed. It takes hours to put the stuff together. And so if you've got it in place ahead of time, you can expedite that process. <clears throat> Unless you have everything in place and can prove it, you may have to return money to the government. If you're not well documented and you don't satisfy an audit, especially with the Department of Defense, you may have to turn around and give money back to the government. You could be subject to legal action. You could be subject to fines. You could be barred from future awards. If the government doesn't like the way you're doing things, they say you're not going to get any money again, and you're on the blacklist and you don't get awards. So there, there are a lot of reasons to put a good process in place. It doesn't have to be elaborate or expansive. It just has to be solid. And oh, here comes the Grim Reaper. All right, the Grim Reaper reminds me to tell you a horror story. Uh, and the horror story this time is one project, one client that I had <clears throat> was, was doing the work, was managing everything just fine. 
the project was getting done. In fact, it was getting done a little faster than scheduled, but they didn't have a budgeting system in place to compare actual costs against the budget. And when the project period ended, they had not spent all the money, but the project period was over and they couldn't spend any more money. As a result, this was a phase one proposal, but as a result, at the end of phase one, they couldn't spend it down. They left money on the table and had to return about $50,000 to the government. Because in phase two, you have to, or when you're selected for a phase two award, you have to tell the government, here's the money we spent in phase one. Well, they realized during the end of the phase one, they didn't spend all the money. And then they found out after the fact, after it closed, and they said, okay, what do we do now? And the program manager said, well, you didn't spend the money. You have to give it back. So they ended up leaving money on the table. They had to return it to the government. <clears throat> Don't let that happen to you. So where it matters, I already said this, it matters a lot in financial review. If you're selected for an award, that's where this system is tested. The system is tested throughout as you do payroll and manage all the uh, interactions day to day. You need to have a good system. Uh, when you do follow on proposals, you need to show strong technical results from an operational standpoint, and you need to show that you can handle the budget. You need to support the budget well. You need to support your indirect rates. That's when the system is tested. During closeout, the system is tested. At closeout, you will have to submit a bunch of documents that say, yes, we spent the money. Yes, our budgets were in place, uh, and a bunch of other documents. At closeout, it's tested, and during audits. Now, um, NSF typically doesn't audit, NIH typically doesn't audit, the Department of Education or NASA typically don't audit, the Department of Defense in phase two quite often will audit. So uh, when you're doing a DOD phase two proposal, you have to be prepared for an audit and you have to be prepared for the, the reporting. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the key features now of an award management system, but let me pause for a moment <coughs> to cough, to get a drink, and to see what questions there might be. Anything, Sherry? Since Steve said he got it, I need to unmute. Before. I was going to say, Steve said he got an SBIR before. Any comments you have about going through financial review after you got your award? This was an SBIR phase one or phase two? It was phase one. And phase it, one. Was, it, it was firm fixed price. Uh, I was preparing in, in hopes of getting a phase two, uh, the, uh, you know, for the, for the cost plus fixed fee con you know, which obviously has the audit, and the, you know, you have to submit indirect rates and all that good stuff. Yeah, so this sounds like it was Department of Defense? DHS for the Coast Guard. Homeland, oh, Homeland Security for the Coast Guard. Boy, it's good to get a proposal from DHS. They don't have a lot of money for SBIR proposals. And so if you've gotten one of those, you're among a select few. That's a pretty competitive <laughs> race. And their, their rates tend to be pretty low. Um, so with that background, Steve, would you ask the question again, please? You didn't ask a question. I put him on the spot to ask oh. how the financial review was. I just saw in the chat that he had that DHS funding. Well, well, let, let me ask the question. Um, I, I've submitted to USDA because we went through um, i -Corps, And so we're, you know, we found a, a, another avenue for our technology. And uh, so I would ask with the um, civilian agencies, you know, phase two, is that still cost plus fixed fee, meaning still have to go through pre-award audit? It depends on the agencies. Uh, with NIH, uh, th those are grants. They're not a cost plus fixed fee. It's fixed price arrangement. NSF will be a grant. Department of Energy will be a cost plus arrangement. USDA officially is fixed price, although they run it like a cost plus, a reimbursable kind of award. Uh, USDA is a weird animal. Um, you will have some level of audit and the level depends on the agency. So yeah, okay. you will have a, a review. Typically they will ask you a bunch of questions. They'll send you a questionnaire 
you fill out the questionnaire, you supply evidence of a financial system, you supply some financial statements, they look them over. If they have questions, they'll ask again. And there are a few rounds of questions, usually with email. And that's what the review looks like. Typically, it's a review, emailed questions and answers. And most of the time, that's satisfactory. Occasionally, you might have to talk to them over the phone. Do all agencies use DCAA as their auditing agency or some of those agencies that you mentioned? Do they do their own audit? No. Uh, uh, NASA uses DCAA. Uh, Department of Defense, obviously, since it's the Defense Contract Audit Agency, DHS is considered Department of Defense, so they will be using DCAA. NIH has its own auditing branch, and NSF has its own, own auditing branch. CAAR is the NSF auditing branch. Department of Education, if you happen to get one of those awards, has its own auditing branch. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Roland, um, we yeah. do have some other questions coming in the chat. Sherry, if you wanted to just talk a little bit about budgeting tools, a couple questions. Yes, so that's one question coming in from Dennis is, are there any budgeting tools you would recommend? And then we have another question after that. And then the similar question maybe from Liz, are there any ERP systems budgeting tools that agencies yeah. don't recommend recipients use? So maybe budgeting tools, this, we have separate sessions that are about putting together your budget for an application, but maybe post award, what kind of budgeting tools do you recommend that people use to keep their finances um, in order? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> the only system that the agency doesn't, agencies don't recommend is just keeping track of yourself in an Excel spreadsheet that usually is deemed inadequate. You actually can do that. You can make an Excel spreadsheet work if you know what you're doing, but usually the level of information and knowledge required to make a Excel spreadsheet work for budgeting is insufficient for these reports. Um, generally, the, the recommendation is to use QuickBooks. Everybody uses it. It's very common. It's uh, government compatible. No one will question it if you're using it. There are two versions of QuickBooks. QuickBooks Desktop is certifiably compatible with government accounting requirements. QuickBooks, the online version, is not required, it's not certified as being government compatible because it doesn't have a fully featured job cost accounting system. However, you can use QuickBooks online with some classification features and some additional add-ons. Well, they're built into the software, but you can make QuickBooks Online be government compatible if you use a classification or a project feature uh, appropriately, if you know how to do that. And I've done that. A lot of my clients are using online that's compatible. So desktop and online, these are the most common packages. They are very frustrating packages. They're very hard to learn, even though QuickBooks wants you to think they're really easy, they really aren't. It takes a, it takes a bit of a learning curve to come up to speed with them. Those are the primary packages to recommend. Deltech is a fancy package that, that is great for government contracting. Peach Software is great for government package. These are good packages. They're more fully featured. They do more for the government. I like them, but they're more expensive and you don't need to go that route. QuickBooks is probably the best package for startups, either QuickBooks Desktop or QuickBooks Online. <clears throat> so those, those are the general tools that I would recommend. All hey, right. Roland, we yeah. had a few comments roll in. Um, oh, goodness. Okay, so. Hopefully you can still hear me. If not. Yep, um, you're I'll good, you're good. Okay. Um, one of the. I'm going to jump in because she's got an audio issue. She's yeah, crazy. yeah. She, I was hearing her, but then she flipped out. <laughs> um, uh, Kadea, which is a, a, a really interesting water bottle um, system that allows for sustainability and, and drinking in office environments and other places, mm. asks about using Oracle NetSuite. Familiarity with that, Roland? Boy, I'm not familiar with that. Oracle NetSuite, I don't know. Can't, can't speak to it. Good question. Kirsten Have to look asked, into it. 
Kirsten asks about zero accounting. Uh, it's X E R O, which I'm not familiar with. Accounting system. Yeah, zero X E R O. I don't know that one. I I do know the the package called Wave, which is an online package. And I've got a lot of concerns about using Wave. I've used Wave and been frustrated with it. You have to really know what you're doing to defeat Wave. Although it's very inexpensive and zero sounds like a wave-like package. Okay, maybe we'll move on and have you keep going on your slides and, and we'll see if questions come. All right, up. yeah, keep, keep the questions coming. I appreciate that. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the, the systems that you need to set up for government uh, costs award management. Job cost accounting system. This is the key aspect of your financial system. You must be able to identify a job associated with every single transaction in the system. In QuickBooks Desktop, there's a job customer feature that lets you do that. In QuickBooks Online, there is more recently a customer and sub-customer feature that lets you do that, but it doesn't cover all transactions. So you have to be a little careful with the QuickBooks Online one, but this is key, job cost accounting, Every single transaction must be able to be identified to a specific job. You need a time tracking system. <laughs> and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail later on, but a system to make sure that all your hours on the job are recorded. You need a work tracking and reporting system. Doesn't have to be elaborate. Here an ad hoc kind of file management structure is appropriate but you need to keep track of the work that you're doing and you need to keep track of it in a way that facilitates eventual reporting. You need to track the contract requirements. There are several requirements outside of the specific work that a contract will impose upon you. You need to understand what they are, know what they are and track all of those. And you need to have written descriptions of these policies and procedures. There's a horror story coming on later that I'll talk to you about written procedures, but you've got to have everything written down. It doesn't have to be excruciating detail. It doesn't have to be lengthy. It doesn't have to be terribly formal, but you need written descriptions of your policies and procedures. You need to have a payroll system in place. I'll talk a little bit about the key elements of a payroll system. Usually that's a little bit more than what an individual wants to do himself. Um, usually you hire that out to have a, a accounting firm do the payroll for you, <clears throat> but uh, I will go over some of the key elements there. First of all, the job cost accounting system. Let's look at some of the major elements there. As I said, all costs must be associated with a specific cost objective. That's a job. It might be the award that you've been given. That's a project or a job. And I use the term project and job interchangeably here. It might be internal research and development that you're doing that isn't funded. It might be general and administrative work, running the company, uh, writing proposals. Every single piece of work that you do has to be associated with some particular job. It might be taking a vacation. From a payable standpoint, a vacation is considered a job because you're getting paid for it. And anything you're paid for is part of the job, so you need to track it in your job cost accounting system. Two main reasons you have to do that. One, you have to prove that you spent the money as awarded in the audits and in subsequent awards. And in phase two uh, financial reviews, you have to prove that you spent the phase money award as attended. Also, you have to support your indirect rate costs. <clears throat> when you submit a proposal, you can say, here are our direct costs, here are our indirect rate costs, and here's how we know what our indirect rates are because we keep We've kept track of them over a period of time, and we can justify that. <clears throat> Key elements of a job cost accounting system. <coughs> you need to use generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, have to follow these principles. You have to be able to produce standard financial statements. You'll get these asked for all the time. Investors will ask them. Uh, SBIR funders will ask for them, profit and loss statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, statement of changes in owner equity. These are the four basic requirements that your system will have to produce. And any software package that you buy will be able to do those. Excel, by the way, doesn't automatically do these. You'd have to generate them within Excel. That's one of the reasons why Excel usually falls a little bit short in terms of financial supporting package. Um, <clears throat> it's not exactly part of the accounting system, but just as a note here, 
unless you're doing $750,000 a year in government awards, you will not need an independent audit. You will not need an independent opinion to look over your financial spreadsheets. So that's one thing that doesn't need to be in place. Also, you'll need a mechanism to compare the actual cost during the project to the budget. That's part of your tech ops system where you need to make sure you're spending the money as intended. And if you're not spending it down, you know, what do you do? You add some people. If you're overspending, what do you do? You maybe uh, make some changes here and there. You adjust the amount of materials and supplies, but you've got to keep visibility at all times so that you can keep track of that. Again, you have to track all the costs by the job, some kind of job. And here, job or project means anything that you get paid for, any expense that the company incurs, any income that you get. Direct costs are those associated with a single project or a single client. You can say, okay, I'm working for this client's project and nothing else. That's direct. Indirect costs are those that can't be allocated to any one particular project, running the company, rent, uh, communications, your website, these kinds of things are indirect costs. They will go into your indirect rate cost structure, which you then calculate when you make a proposal. There are also set of unallowable costs that you have to be able to track for. There are certain costs that the government will not reimburse you for, either as direct or indirect. Intellectual property work usually is indirect. Uh, gifts to charity are indirect. General company marketing, presence at trade shows, these are unallowable costs that you can't include in your rate structure. Birthday parties, you can't include those. Trips to the Bahamas, if you can afford it, you still can't include that. You can deduct it from your IRS taxes, perfectly allowable for IRS purposes, but not allowable in terms of government contract reimbursement. And your labor costs also have to be segregated by job, not just your material expenses, but your labor costs, which means you have to have a good time tracking system. The time tracking system is the mechanism by which you track all the hours that you spent. And then with that time tracking system, you have to be able to convert the time that you spent to the cost associated with that time. Brief aside here, it's not on the pro uh, on the, the slide, but if you are a salaried individual, your salary doesn't change. You get the same amount of money every month, but each month you will spend a different percentage of your time on GNA, on direct projects, on IR&D, on proposal writing. You'll spend a different amount of time. So every month you have to calculate the cost of your time based on the percentage of your total time that month that you spent on that particular job. Hey, Roland, Manuela yeah. had a question, if she yeah. could, before we keep moving forward. Do you want to ask that? Ah, uh, yes. Thanks so much, Laura and Roland. Would, Roland, would you mind going back one slide? Thank you. Yeah, just want to um, understand, make sure that I understand. So um, today we got an SBIR phase one. We're going through the paperwork right now. Oh, congratulations. Well, yes. you got selected for an award, right? You don't have the award yet. Correct. We don't oh, okay. have the money yeah. in the bank, We, but we, I guess, are eligible to now submit a lot of paperwork. Um, and we, when you talk about direct costs associated with a single project or client, we only have this one um, target. We only have one target customer for this SBIR. So when you talk about direct costs, you're only talking about the cost of a single project or client under the Cyber umbrella, right? They don't need to know about our other commercial clients, or or is that also a direct cost that we can fold into the accounting? If you have other commercial clients, good for you. That's good. They are also direct expenses, and you will need to track the expenses for those commercial clients as well as the expenses for your SBIR. You will need to track them so that you can calculate your indirect expense rates. Unless you know all the money that you spent on the SBIR project directly and all the money you spent on your other consultants directly, you won't have a base for doing the simple division by which you calculate the indirect costs. Perfect. Thank you. So, so yeah, that's a good question. That's important. A lot of people ask that question, so I'm glad you asked it. Great. Thank you very much. While we're stopped, anything else here? Um, yeah, so um, Dennis has a question. 
recommendations for time tracking software. Do you have any? Uh, yeah, there are a lot of packages. There are a lot of good ones. If you're using QuickBooks, then QuickBooks Time is really nice for syncing with time tracking. If you have a small operation, uh, Excel works fine. You have to do a little bit of math to do the labor allocation that I talked about, but Excel works just great as a time tracking system. It doesn't have to be elaborate or fancy. There are a few qualifications that it has to meet, but Excel works great. And, and up, my borderline is like four to six people. If you've got four to six people or fewer, then you might as well just keep track on paper or via an Excel spreadsheet. If you get more than that, then the administrator becomes a little onerous and it's time to go to another package. Um, let's see, QuickBooks Time is the one that I typically use just because it syncs so well with QuickBooks, but QuickBooks Time charges you a base rate and they charge you by the individual. So if, you know, if, if your company grows, you pay $4 a month per person to do the time tracking. And so that can start eating into your budget if it gets really big, but any time tracking system is going to incur some kind of, a um, you know, <clears throat> expense like that. Is there a time tracking system that you have in mind? Uh, maybe I've heard of it. Maybe drop in the chat and roll in your next slide was talking about time keeping. So we'll keep moving. Yeah. <clears throat> so the time tracking system is, is one of the ones that I get the most resistance about because professionals are professionals and academicians are academicians and they do their job and they get results. And why do they have to report the amount of time that they spend doing it? But in fact, you are working for the government now, and the government wants to know exactly how much time you're spending on their project. They want to know how much percentage of your time is allocable to that project. And to calculate that percentage of time, you need to keep track of your time on all projects, including vacation, including GNA, including anything that you're paid to do. Similarly to lab results, you know, if you're in the lab, and working on results, you record everything scrupulously. You don't let anything slide. Those lab results are very important. Well, to the government, they're paying you based on time. They're reimbursing you based on an expectation of value and cost of time put in. So they expect the same kind of scrupulous attention to time tracking that they do to lab results. So get used to it. This is a professional experience. It's a professional obligation. You just keep track of your time. Make it easy. <clears throat> and that's when I set up my systems. I always try to make it very easy to record the time. These online systems and these Excel spreadsheets are really easy to do. It can become uh, um, a habit. Now, some of the key features. <coughs> Employees have to fill out the timesheets. Supervisors have to improve them, approve them. That approval process is very important. No matter what the system is, there has to be an approval process whereby the individual fills it out and the supervisor approves it. Now, if you're a one-person company, you have no choice but to approve your own timesheet. If you have anybody else working with you, then that other individual can be the second countersigner. If you're the head of the company, the CEO, the founder, the president, the head honcho, and you've got a timesheet and you've got a, a clerical staff, the clerical staff can sign off on it just to show that there are two levels of review. You need to have an interface with the payroll accounting system. Some, act, some mechanism for taking your costs and translating them to dollars. If you're getting paid by the hour, that's pretty straightforward. Just the dollars per hour translates pretty directly. If you're a salaried individual, the translation is not that clean. And so you need to do these allocations. So some kind of a connection with payroll and accounting. Incidentally, if you're using QuickBooks Time and QuickBooks Desktop, QuickBooks will do this calculation for you. If you're using QuickBooks Time and QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks will not do this calculation for you. This is one of the reasons why QuickBooks Online fails when it comes to be a fully compliant government approved accounting system. It's because that system cannot do the calculation for cost allocation. You have to do that by hand and do some hand entries in order to make that happen. Third major area of importance for a requirement for government uh, timekeeping is a change control procedure. People forget things, they leave the clock on when they should clock out, they, they forget to record time off, they, they make some mistakes and they need to make changes. This happens all the time. There needs to be a system in place. That system has to have a resubmission with explanation showing original time and replacement time. 
and it has to have a reapproval showing both. And so you need to resubmit showing the change, reapprove showing the change. That change controls procedure. So these bottom threes are the key elements of a time tracking system. As I mentioned, this can be paper based, it can be electronic. Uh, <clears throat> The system, the change control needs to be in place and the policy has to be written. Um, <clears throat> in your phase one review, they will ask you for a copy of your timesheet policy, your time tracking policy and a copy of your timesheet. If you don't have that one, Manuela, be ready for it, get it ready. That's gonna be one of the things they ask for. They'll want to see your time tracking system, a, a description of it, they'll wanna see your policy and they'll wanna see your timesheet. So you have to have an example ready to go. All right, that's time tracking and finances. So before we move ahead to contract requirements tracking, any questions, finances, time tracking? All right, let's go ahead and hold move on, on. Hold on, hold on, one just came through. Ah, uh, no, no, too late, too late. No. <laughs> it go says, ahead, it. <laughs> Kirsten says, do they want an example that is filled out? or just the copy of the form? You know, if you've got one that's filled out, that's better. If you haven't done one before because you haven't had a reason to because you're just starting up, then a copy of the form. What you need to show on the form will be an example of all the projects. They'll need to see a listing of the projects that people can charge time to. They'll need to see the mechanism for charging time, you know, by day, by hour, you know, they'll need to see it. So the form is usually acceptable if you don't have one. If you've got one filled out, it looks a little bit more credible. Okay, that's uh, that's all for now. Thank you. All right, never too late. Always feel free to ask questions. Okay, contract requirements tracking. <clears throat> this takes some time. When you get the contract, you'll get a lot of documents, more than you will ever be able to read. And so you will have to spend time on a few key documents, understanding the requirements in those documents. And you'll have to glance over some of the other documents that they refer to that are more comprehensive than you'll ever need to deal with. Key documents are the award letter. Look at this carefully, six to 12 pages. It'll tell you what's most important uh, to meet in terms of the contract. Uh, terms and conditions, quite often you'll have a general terms and conditions and you'll have a specific terms and conditions, two documents. I've listed them as one here. Sometimes you'll get a set of reporting requirements as a separate document, federal FARC, FARC, uh, federal access reporting requirements or something like that. You'll get a list of reporting requirements, know those and look them over. So those are the key ones. Uh, NSF gives you a very nice new awardee guide. It's about 15 pages long. It'll tell you everything that you have to keep track of. It's a very good review. So I'd recommend looking that over if you get an NSF award. All of these will point to the Code of Federal Regulations, though. They'll point to requirements in the CFRs. A lot of them will report to the Federal Acquisition Regulations, the FARs. And when you point to these FARs, uh, they're, they're long, they're complex. You know, they're, they're more than you'll ever look at. You can kind of glance at the titles of the FARs. There's usually a list of applicable FARs and kind of see which ones apply to you or see which ones sound like they might apply to you and then go look at that particular FAR. You can look them up. Same thing with the CFRs. Those are accounting. They tend to be accounting regulations. You won't need to know all of these in details. You'll, you won't be able to spend the time. You'll spend all your time just reading requirements if you only look at CFRs and FARs. They're extensive. So glance over those. But the award level terms, terms and conditions, reporting requirements, get those in place and make sure you've got a system for tracking all these requirements. Know what they are, follow up regularly and make sure that you're meeting those requirements. <clears throat> Reviews and <coughs> reports are really important. This is technical work reports. You'll have a certain format that's required. Uh, NSF uh, recently changed to the RPPR format. NIH has been using the RPPR format for a long time. You won't get a letter saying, here's the format. You'll get a letter saying, when you reach your proposal, or you know, when you're done, you'll have to submit a final report. So you have to go to research.gov or to ERA Commons or to whatever funding agency has given you the award and find their reporting mechanism 
look at the final report, get an example of what you need to do, understand the categories of the final report. And then I recommend once a month during a regular review, jot down notes about your project work in the format of that project report so that when the closeout report comes, you'll have all the information over time that you'll be able to populate the report. Otherwise, you'll get to the end of the project, you'll say RPPR, what in the world does that stand for? Um, all right, let's look it up and you kind of try and find it. It's not even easy to find in ERA Commons. It takes a couple weird clicks to find it. You finally find it and you go, you know, what, what does this mean? You know, what is work product? How do they define that? What is impact? What is impact for training? And then, then you'll wonder what you did in these different areas all along. So get that started right away. Understand that reporting format. This is technical and operations work, but understand the reporting format. And then every month, write that down in a regular review so that when the report comes along, you're not surprised and the report will write itself. Another aspect of contract requirements tracking that gets overlooked is the relationship with the program manager. And every agency is different. Every program manager is different in terms of what information he or she would like to receive during the course of the project. So at the beginning of the project, when you set it up, you'll have a kickoff meeting. This is one of the questions to ask that program manager. Ask them, when do you want to be informed? What level of information do you want at what stages, at key points? You know, what's, what's critical? What level of budget change should I talk to you about? What level of budget change do you want to hear? Do you want to not hear about what it's noise? Understand those preferences, find them out so that you know how to keep in touch with the program manager over time. Another aspect of contract requirements, subcontract management. And here, when we go back to these terms and conditions, the terms and conditions, especially the specific and general terms and conditions will list flow down clauses that you have to include in the subcontract. So when you develop a subcontract and write the subcontract, you'll need to refer back to those award documents and say, okay, the award document says by US is a federal acu uh, a FAR, federal acquisition regulation that has to be appear in the subcontracts. So it's got to flow down to the subcontracts and they'll have a list of flow down clauses that have to appear in the subcontract clauses understand them and make sure that they do appear in the flow down clauses. Subcontract management also includes monitoring <clears throat> and reporting. A lot of times you will rely on your subcontractor for information that feeds into your project reports. When you know the project reports to begin with, then you can work with the subcontractor all along and say, okay, here's the information we're gonna need from you every few months or every period of time and make sure that you're preparing that for us. You will need to get work product from subcontractors and consultants, especially for the DOD. This is not important for the non-auditing agencies, but for the ones that audit, when they audit, they'll come around and say, prove to us that these people actually did work. Now, if you're a software developer, you don't turn over reams of code. Uh, if you're a hardware developer or some kind of a device developer, you're not actually turning over the device. You don't show the device. The only thing you show is a report that says that you completed this revise, device or that you did this work. So in your subcontracts, you want reports that indicate that they did the work, evidence of work product. So some evidence that they have actually performed the work, you've got to build that into your con subcontracting management system. <clears throat> Contract requirements. I also included financial viability requirements. <clears throat> financial viability can be a number of different things, but when you do, especially the phase two award selection reviews for NSF, they will look for two main key indicators. One is they like to see four to six months of operating costs on hand. So you could last for four to six months in the event of a funding interruption. They have seen too many companies just go by the wayside, uh, one minor perturbation, and they can't meet payroll and they fold. So they wanna see financial viability in terms of four to six months of operating costs on hand. NSF also looks for some ratios, the ratio of assets to liabilities. They wanna see assets liability, that ratio greater than one, one or greater. If they see that you have more debt than you have assets on hand, 
they get very concerned and they will ask a, a lot about that. I had one client, this isn't a horror story yet because it's a good story, but one client had an asset ratio, uh, asset to liability ratio of less than one. That's when NSF talked to the person and there was additional interaction. They supplied the client, the company supplied some additional information and they in fact got the award because of the strength of that additional information, but it took an additional iteration to do that. All right, any questions on contract requirements? <clears throat> Moving on, never too late. If they come up, feel free to pop them in the chat. <clears throat> I mentioned before you have to document policies and procedures. These are some of the key areas where you should have some kind of documentation. Financial system overview. Like, you know, four to five pages is fine. Here's the package that we use. Here's how we make sure that it's a job costing accounting system. Here's how we're aware of unallowable costs. Here's our data entry mechanism. Here's how we make sure that everything has a job. Here are the levels of oversight that we have. We've got an outside consultant who helps. We have a financial firm that helps, a CPA that helps, whatever. You know, four to five pages, just here's basically how that system operates. And then you need detailed financial system procedures. Rarely will you have to actually produce these, but you will have to respond to a questionnaire that says you have them. And so if you've got them on hand, informal is fine, just descriptive and appropriate timekeeping policies and procedures, you will be asked for them. So you have to have those in place. You should have an employee policy and a benefits policy. Even if you don't have an entire employee handbook, you'll need to have your benefits policy intact. <clears throat> and here comes the Grim Reaper again to talk uh, to remind me to talk about a horror story. In this particular case, I had a client who <clears throat> had uh, decided that one of their graduate students, they were going to put back and uh, support him to get a second degree, which is perfectly allowable. And so they spent some $50,000 on tuition for an individual to get a second degree. It's all allowable if it's documented and if the agreement is made beforehand. They did not document their policy beforehand. They just communicated it verbally. They put it in their indirect rate cost rate because they thought it was allowable which it was had it been documented, but the documentation about that education policy was not sufficient. Six years later, after that individual had been productively working at the company with a new uh, degree, during a DCAA audit, DCAA says, you did not document this policy carefully enough, you have to return $50,000 to the government. They had no choice but to do that. They actually had to return $50,000 to the government just because the documentation was not sufficient regarding one particular personnel policy. So that's the importance of having these documentation in place for policies and procedures. <clears throat> All right, last section here, a few key words on payroll. <laughs> <clears throat> there are a lot of payroll documents you have to collect and you have to keep. The I-9 document is the main document for statutory employees that says that you're employed. You have to make sure and get that. And there's some supporting documentation that's required that you have to have on file. You should get a W-4, you should get an ILW-4 for both Illinois and, and the federal government. You might want an offer letter, you might want an employment agreement, you might want a non-disclosure agreement. These are all not required, but if you have them, you wanna keep them in place, I recommend them. I think they're good documents to have. <clears throat> Sometimes you want to keep biosketch and other information about the employees. You should have a file of every employee so that, that information about that employee is kept available. If you have evaluations, they will go in the file. If you have a termination, you'll want to have a record of termination, a date of termination, some kind of a memo of termination, put that in the file. All these kinds of documents should be handled. They can be all electronic. You don't need to have it on paper. Electronic is just fine. Although they can be scanned in, shredded, and kept electronically. You're good there. <clears throat> You will have to have a system that pays people when they need to be paid and that pays taxes and reports the tax returns when they need to be done. US 940 is federal unemployment. You have to submit that once a year. US 941 is a federal social security withholding and Medicare. Usually that's quarterly for a small firm. Illinois also has a 921, 941, that's quarterly. 
Illinois also requires unemployment. You do that with this UI340 to the Illinois Department of Employment Security. That's quarterly in most cases. At the end of the year, you have to file a W-2 with the IRS for each employee, and then you have to file a W-3. That's just a listing of all your W-2s. The W-2s go out to the employees. The W-3 goes to the government. 1099s are the documents that you use to, to support the amount of money that you've spent on individuals who are contractors rather than employees. 1096 is the form that you send to the federal government that lists all of the 1099s that you've given out. Also related to payroll, you will need workers' comp insurance, almost certainly in the state of Illinois. Now, my company, Garton Consulting, doesn't need workers' comp insurance because the company has two people and we're both owners. So we don't have to have it. But most companies with any employee who's a non-owner will be required to have workers' comp insurance. So you need to have that in place. Also, this gets overlooked a lot. Know the difference between a contractor and an employee. The tests in Illinois for contractor are threefold. The contractor, in order to be established as a contractor, has to be free from direct control of his or her job by the company. So if you hire a, an accountant to come and help you keep the books, well, that could be an, a contractor because you're not telling them how to keep the books. They're deciding that themselves. The contractor also has to perform out services, uh, services outside the main goal of the business. If you're doing research and development in technology, which all of you are, and you hire a contractor to help you with marketing, well, you're not primarily a marketing firm, you're primarily an R&D firm. So that marketing contractor is outside of your main kind of business. The CPA who's helping you out with finances or the contractor, they're not really your main line of business. You're not keeping books as your main line of business. So they can be outside of the main line of business. And they have to be established as an independent professional who offers services to more than one company. Miss any one of these, and you're probably dealing with an employee situation where you have to hire them and they become a W-2 employee rather than a contractor who's a 1099 employee. And here comes the Grim Reaper again to remind me of another horror story. And this was recent. I had a client recently that had an audit, just a random audit. They weren't suspected of any wrongdoing from the Illinois Department of Employee Security saying, we noticed that you have a number of contractors. And so we're going to make sure that they really are contractors. And IDES performed an IDES audit on this company. I supported the audit. And during the course of the audit, IDES determined that one employee or one individual who had been employed as a contractor, in fact, was not a contractor. IDES deemed them to be an employee. As a result, that company had to pay back taxes on that employee as if the person had been an employee. And they had to pay penalties on those taxes because Illinois deemed that they hadn't paid the taxes on time, so they assessed penalties. So you had back taxes and penalties that were occurred well after the fact, just because this client wasn't really well aware of the distinction between contractors and employees. <laughs> All right. This timed out very well. We have about five minutes left, and I'd love to entertain any questions or any horror stories that you'd like to share related to actually running the company once you get the award. Uh, this is Sherry. For those who want to share, I believe you can unmute yourself. If you want to jump in and ask Dennis, a question. A, Dennis has his hand up, so maybe. He's got oh, a I didn't see that. Thank you. All right, Dennis, yeah, why don't you just unmute? Yep, uh, great talk. So uh, I, I have a question. I'm representing an early stage startup. Uh, currently, there's a few employees on staff. Um, they're all being uh, compensated in sweat equity, however. So uh, each of the employees is getting some part of the company, some level of equity. Uh, if we were ever to compete for SBIR funding, uh, what would your recommendations be? Uh, should we start from now keeping track of uh, the time that's spent on various projects and how much everybody is contributing to those just to get into that habit? Or what are your thoughts on this situation? 
Uh, that's that's a really good question. I'm glad you mentioned that because this comes up a lot. It's a question that I didn't address, but it's one that, that I get all the time. You know, I think it's a good practice to get used to spending your time. From a management standpoint, it's nice to know. You can learn some things. When you really look at how you spend your time, it can often be quite different than what you think. And you have to start asking yourselves, hmm, we're spending a lot of time in this area. Should we really be doing that? We better make some changes. So from a management standpoint, I would always advocate time tracking. But the larger point is that when you justify the expense of what of the money that a company has spent on a project, you have to pay people. You've got to give them money. Otherwise, there's no basis for claiming reimbursement. There's no basis, no financial basis for claiming that you've actually spent the money. If your individuals want to return that money to the company, and if you pay them and then they return the value to, for stock equity, that's perfectly legitimate. And that's a transaction that if handled properly can be handled on paper. So if in fact, de facto, they're willing to work for sweat equity, you can structure your financial system so that they get a paycheck, but that paycheck is tracked, it is appropriately taxed, and then money that's left over goes back into the company that can all be handled financially and on paper so that you don't actually move, move the money around if the people want to do that. The important thing, though, is that you have to have some form of payment, some mechanism of payment in order to justify the expense on any particular project. So I'm glad you glad you brought that up because it comes up all the time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so one other point. Um, so oh, let's say that everybody is being compensated with sweat equity uh, currently, and then we start looking at applying for an SBIR. Would it look bad if... For example, everybody, if, if there's no payroll existing within the company, would they say, well, it looks like you don't have any employees that you're paying. So um, maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know. No, there's, there's no problem with that. That's perfectly all right. They don't look okay. into history at the phase one because a lot of companies get phase one awards that don't even exist except on paper. They haven't even okay. been doing anything. They've they've got the, the paperwork together so that they officially exist as a company, but operationally, they're not doing anything. So they have no history, no payroll, and yet they get funded. And so, you know, not having the history at phase one is not a, a, a showstopper. So, uh, you know, at this point, I wouldn't go to the bother of doing payroll just on the off chance that you might get an SBIR award. You really don't need to establish payroll until you actually get the SBIR award. Okay. And so even at the proposal Rowan. stage, yeah, you don't have to have that. Yeah. So we have two more hands up, if you can stick with it just a little bit longer. So sure. I, I'm gonna call on Manuela first. Thank you very much. Um, I, hopefully this will be a quick question for this uh, phase one SIBR that we got. Uh, do we want to assert data rights? There's standard wording and you want to use the standard wording for data rights. The standard wording is that you assert data rights, but you give the government uh, rights to use the data. <clears throat> And I forget the exact classification, but there's a standard classification that, that in fact, is, is just that. You assert rights, yes, but you grant the government usage rights. Okay. Uh, and that means that we own the data, correct? Yeah. Okay. Roland, is is there like a, a URL reference point for that online somewhere for the standard language and and guidance, I seem to recall there might be something from a past training I took, but it's been a while. Oh boy, I wouldn't know it offhand. You wouldn't know? Okay. If I find it, Manuela, I'll, I'll share that with you. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay, so um, is it okay if I move on to Patrick? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. All right, Patrick, you're up. Hi, can you hear me? You're good. Uh, thanks for the talk, Roland. Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned um, uh, that companies should probably have four to six months of runway on hand in case of any hiccups or delays in funding and whatnot. Right. Um, 
My company is a brand new startup, um, and our first dollar of funding will be the phase one SBIR if we are awarded it. Um, is there uh, any way around that? Like, does it look bad that we don't have any other um, money on hand for additional runway? Ah, important distinction. So thank you for raising the question. Those equity ratios show up during the phase two review. For phase one, that's not a concern. As I mentioned before, a lot of companies get funding for phase one that don't exist at all and don't have a dollar of revenue and don't have right. a dollar of reserves. So no, that is not a problem for phase one. I'm glad you brought that up to make that distinction. Oh, okay. So phase Good. two, we're gonna want some runway though. I mean, you'll want runway, yeah, from a management standpoint. From a phase one funding standpoint, you won't get asked that question for phase one. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Steve Newton, who went and found um, the statement on on data. Oh, great. And and put a um, and posted it in the chat. So if you're interested in that, make sure you click the little three dots to get a copy of the chat. Um, and thank you, Steve. <laughs> And yes, thank you, Roland. All right. And you know, as, as Laura said, resources are available to help you. So just contact the FAST site and, and ask for them. And Sherry will talk to you and get an understanding of what you need and find someone who can help you out. That's what we're here to do. So good luck to all of you on your journey with businesses and with SBIR proposals. Oh, Allison, you had a I see you've got a question. Go ahead. Nice to see you again, by the way. Oh, and nice to see you. I don't particularly have a question. I was just going to point out, um, just for a point of information, not a Grim Reaper story, but um, one of our employees, um, we had kind of a mix of people because we needed some specialized coding to do this um, three-dimensional and augmented reality work. And um, so a couple of the employees were um, American and they were um, a little you know, easier to employ conventionally. The other one was not. And um, he had a, I guess the country of origin for him uh, they had a treaty with the U.S. Um, for the first five years that they have um, a, th that foreign national be in the U.S., they don't have to pay taxes. So, but what happened was, um, as soon as you know, we kind of got to the the later years after they had graduated, they, they were on OPT STEM. Um, I made the decision to get a pretty formal um, software. I mean, we're pretty I went with ADP to do our payroll. And I was really, really glad I did because the student had thought um, that for five years started that process on when he came to the country, but it wasn't, it started on the calendar year. So we had to go back and do corrections for um, the, all of those reporting tax groups and the ADP did it for no cost. So oh, wow. I Grateful because um, and that was ADP that did that. Well, wow, on a foreign employee, that's good. That's good service. Yes, and so I and I was able to negotiate kind of like preferred pricing with them, but that completely saved us because I would not have been able to go back and create you know correct all of those quarterly statements to the Illinois is strict in and of itself, but then the feds and then make sure that those got in and, and that the, they were in a report system that our own accountant could work with that. So I was just gonna point out, like sometimes you think, oh, we shouldn't pay that extra money or whatnot, but if you've got that type of mix of student to maybe, you know, OPT and you're not sure, it, I recommend something like that because it saved me. Ah, good point, thank you. <laughs> All Thanks right. Yeah, go ahead, Sherry. I just wanted to say thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. All right. Bye. You.